On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including the Artemis lunar missions set a target for first flight, China launches their second Tiangong station module, and NASA is planning for their next big telescope. There's lots to go over this week, so let's get going. This is the Space Race. On Thursday, July 21st, the thunder of a massive rocket booster roared through the Utah desert. The horizontal engine burning for 126 seconds and producing 3.6 million pounds of force at over 2,000 degrees Celsius. This was the test of the Flight Support Booster 2 destined for the SLS rocket, and it is just the tip of the iceberg that is NASA's lunar preparations. The Space Launch System rocket is NASA's next best chance at landing on the moon, the largest and most powerful space vehicle they've developed since their last moon rocket, the Saturn V of the late 1960s. And while the Saturn V was able to make the journey from development to launch at a breakneck speed of just five years, the SLS has proven to be a multi-decade challenge. While work was being done repairing the SLS's quick disconnect module, which failed during a wet dress rehearsal for the rocket on June 20th, NASA was conducting this full-scale booster test with aerospace partners Northrop Grumman at the company's testing facility in Promontory, Utah. The flight support booster, specifically FSB-2, is a solid fuel booster engine, one of those white rockets that are strapped to the side of the rocket's main tank just like we saw on the old space shuttle. They provide the rocket with some crucial extra thrust to get through the heaviest, densest part of our gravity and atmosphere. And FSB-2 is an exciting look into the future of the SLS. Currently, the first eight Artemis missions are using what NASA calls a robust mix of new avionics and substantial heritage hardware from the space shuttle program. Basically, NASA and Northrop Grumman had some leftovers from the 80s that they didn't want to go to waste, so they're using legacy shuttle boosters on the SLS. Of course, using them forever was never the plan, and the old space shuttle boosters are going to be phased out after the first eight missions. Bruce Tiller, NASA's SLS booster program manager, explains further, saying, This particular ground test will demonstrate some new materials a completely new steering system, and a new way to ignite the motor. Data from this test will improve our booster design for future missions that take us farther into deep space than ever before. Definitely good to see some headway being made with new rocket technology from NASA, especially with a potential launch window for Artemis 1 right around the corner. NASA's been very careful about setting hard dates for their notoriously delay-prone rocket, but it looks like they're really gunning for the 25th launch period, which runs from August 23rd to September 6th. Ideally, they are targeting August 29th for the first launch. Though SLS could launch in the next period, September 19th to October 4th, the mission parameters of Artemis 1 make the August window, with its longer delay launch windows, a much more appealing time frame. Not only that, but launching in August is just better for Artemis 1 in general. The first mission in NASA's latest lunar series intends on sending an uncrewed Orion capsule on a flight around the moon using the lunar gravity to slingshot the capsule, a maneuver called a free return trajectory, and get it back to Earth in about 42 days. Launching in late September certainly doesn't seem ideal for a mission that runs over a month. The current tentative schedule assumes all repairs will be completed by that window, an assumption made more precarious by the unexpectedly difficult repair work. Jim Free, NASA's Director of Exploration, explained that the work to repair the hydrogen quick disconnect was more invasive than originally thought. The repair crews reportedly had to work inside the claustrophobic first stage engine compartment to get the job done. And it needs work. NASA has a strict timetable of upcoming missions that mostly rely on the previous one being completed. Should Artemis 1 work in 2024, Artemis 2 will send astronauts in an Orion capsule following Artemis 1's lead on a trip around the moon and back. After that, 
NASA will begin sending a landing party in 2025 or 2026 for Artemis 3. And that's just the mainline Artemis missions. There is a side chain of support missions like Capstone, Trailblazer, and now a new NASA-funded commercial mission is slated for 2025. Commercial Lunar Payload Services, or CLPS, have a reported $73 million contract to land the first NASA payload, the Draper Series 2, on the far side of the moon to collect data. Nothing's been there since China landed their Chang'e 4 mission there in 2019, and NASA is hoping to get some good data from the probe once it lands in the Schrodinger crater, giving better context to the data that astronauts landing in the near side southern pole will be getting. And of course, there's the Lunar Gateway project, aiming to start construction of an orbiting lunar station in 2024 with the launch of its first module, the Habitation and Logistics Outpost, or HALO, aboard a SpaceX Falcon Heavy. And even though these missions don't make use of the SLS, without that rocket's success, NASA's plans for the moon are essentially at a standstill. With all that said, however, NASA is reporting that all repair work was completed during the July 16th weekend, meaning that SLS's launch date is only subject to testing the new line fittings and pre-flight checks. The history of the SLS has certainly been a tad rocky, but NASA's really pushing to get the job done on a very full schedule. The dates don't represent the agency's launch commitment, but Director Jim Free gives it to us straight, saying, quote, We'll make the agency commitment for a launch at the first readiness review just a little over a week before launch, but these are the dates that the team is working to. Here's hoping we see Artemis 1 take off in late August. The SLS team could use the win, and we'd all love to see NASA's flag orbiting the moon again. There are many reasons to learn a new language, but one of my favorite reasons is that it increases neuroplasticity, which improves your brain function and helps prevent cognitive decline, which is why I am excited to share today's sponsor, Babbel. I'm always looking for ways to keep my brain active and learning, and learning a new language is one of the best ways while being super helpful in other daily activities. I've been learning to speak more Italian to better connect with my nonna and nonno, and using Babbel has made it a lot easier. Babbel teaches real-world practical conversations in short 10-minute interactive lessons using their award-winning technology that is scientifically proven to get you speaking in just three weeks. And with multiple ways to learn, including lessons, podcasts, games, videos, and even live classes, you'll pick up a new language faster than ever before. My nonna makes the best lasagna, so whenever we go over for dinner, a simple phrase I end up using is per favore puoi passare le lasagna, which translates to can you please pass the lasagna, because you always end up wanting a little bit more. You can start learning a new language in three weeks with Babbel, and right now you can get 65% off your subscription by clicking on our custom link found in the description. I highly recommend learning a new language. There are so many benefits, so click the link in the description now to get 65% off your subscription. And now, let's get back to the video. China put their planning into practice on Sunday the 24th as the Wenxian module of the Tiangong space station was delivered safely to orbit on top of a massive Long March 5B heavy lift rocket. The launch is the first of two major module launches that the Chinese manned space agency plans on completing this year. In preparation for the construction, a crew of three Taikonauts was sent up in early June, whose primary role for their mission will be the connection of the two new modules onto the Tiangong station. Both modules, the Wenxian and its companion Mengxian, due in October, will advance the Tiangong space station from a simple habitat to an operational orbiting lab. And, as a bonus, Make it look like a T, which is thematically pleasing, if nothing else. The Wenxian is equipped with more sleeping quarters, allowing the station to sustain as many as six crew members, temporarily at least. But the big deal is the experimenting cabinets, which will allow the crew to begin doing science aboard the station. Which is the whole point of the Tiangong. 
China's plan for the station is to fit it with a massive Hubble-like telescope called the Shunxian and host over 1,000 experiments from around the world to help study the very fabric of space. The current list was created by collaborating with the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs and involves 23 institutions from 17 nations. This is especially generous of them considering China has generally been left out of the ISS experiment. And with the ISS quickly reaching the end of its lifespan, the Tiangong may soon be the only well-equipped station left in our orbit, at least until Starlab, Axiom, and the orbital reef stations get up and running. China has said repeatedly for the last couple of years that their endeavors in space, be it Tiangong, their moon missions, or other planetary explorations, are being done with the focus of sharing their findings with the world, and with every decision they've made, China has only reinforced that pledge. Tiangong represents a continuation of humanity's efforts to study our place in the universe. And we're personally very glad China is keeping the tradition of the space race being ultimately a cooperative endeavor alive. NASA's powerful James Webb Space Telescope showed off its full power recently to the awe of the international community. The images taken are the most detailed we've ever seen and have already led to several new discoveries. There's just one problem. It needs a spotter. The JWST is a precision instrument, able to hone in on an incredibly small area of our sky and blow it up in stunning detail. One astronomer mentioned that the new photos we saw from the telescope were taken of a portion of the sky that was no bigger than a grain of sand held at arm's length. That's pretty precise. Too precise to pick targets on its own. Luckily, NASA thought of that. The National Academy's 2010 Astrophysics Decadal Survey identified the then-titled Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope as its highest priority mission. Renamed to the Roman Telescope after pioneering astronomer Nancy Grace Roman, the surveying telescope is a $4.3 billion mission planned for five years of operation. Coming in just slightly smaller than the JWST, the Roman is equipped with a massive 7.9 foot diameter meter. That's the same size as Hubble's mirror, but the Roman's wide field imaging capabilities will reportedly give the new telescope a field of view 100 times wider than its predecessor, and with the same resolution in less time. The main mission for Roman will be to gather large swaths of the sky looking to study things like dark matter, exoplanets, and stars. This will of course also give plenty of targets for the JWST to take a much closer look at, and NASA is expecting that the Roman could help measure light from a billion galaxies and discover thousands of exoplanets over its five-year mission. The 4.6-ton spacecraft will need a powerful boost to get to the planned L2 halo orbit of Earth, so NASA chose SpaceX's Falcon Heavy platform to do the job. This makes yet another NASA contract for SpaceX, with the Psyche asteroid mission in 2023, the Europa Clipper mission in 2024, and several other government launches crowding the next few years. Launch is currently planned for October 2026 from Pad 39A at Cape Canaveral's Kennedy Space Center. Having an array of space telescopes helping each other out will significantly speed up the work NASA is doing to identify planets, stars, and phenomena. The images and discoveries can only get better. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.